Good afternoon. Welcome to our little talk on the Ukraine, the situation in Ukraine. As I mentioned earlier, in 1913, part of the Ukraine was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And those Ukrainians that came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire to Canada were uh, put into prisons, uh, concentration camps, for the duration of the war. And it shows you the great divide because you have those Austro-Hungarian Ukrainians, you have the Ukrainians of, of, uh, who speak Ukrainian but are part of the Russian Empire, and to the east of the Dnieper River is a large ethnic minority of Russian Ukrainians. So you know, tremendous ethnic difficulties in this region. And importantly, during the Second World War, the Ukraine mustered two divisions of Nazi SS troops. One went to fight into the uh, Carpathian Mountains, which is that former Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire territory. The other moved, retreated west into uh, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, and one of the Baltic republics. The, according to CIA documents, uh, they were responsible for the deaths of 100,000 uh, civilians. One of them and uh, his followers, one of the, the commander of one of those brigades, the one that went west, actually immigrated into the United States of America where he died in the 1990s. And he got special permission under the CIA Act to immigrate into the country. That's Mr. Liebed. The history of this area is fraught with ethnic minorities throughout its long, long history. Today our speaker uh, Roger uh, is a working, retired aerospace worker in Vancouver. He has traveled to Moscow and the Crimea recently for a conference on the current situation in the Ukraine. Please give a big hand for Roger Annis. Um, I gave a, a, a talk uh, just a little under one month ago, right across the hall, on, uh, on this subject. Uh, it was a one-hour talk, and I won't do that today because I want to leave lots of time for discussion. Plus, lots of things have happened in the past month, and this topic is an ongoing one that requires a lot of attention, study, debate, discussion. So I'll also include some of that in my talk as well, what we've learned from the last month. So I'll give you a shortened version. And if you want to uh, see the talk I gave a month ago, which has more background information than I'll be able to provide here, then you can go either to YouTube or to my own website. Just do a quick search for under part of that title. We'll uh, get you to there. So I, I do suggest that you do that if you want uh, to get more information. When we talk of Ukraine, I like to think that we're talking about hallowed ground. This was one of the um, peoples of the former Russian Tsarist Empire that fought for their right to be a people. And it was a very difficult and bitter a struggle that they waged during the 19th and early, early 20th centuries. And then they, this people staged a remarkable revolution, which was not just part of a broader Re Russian revolution. There was a very distinct Ukrainian socialist revolution that took place in 1917 and 1918, driven, of course, by the same factors as the Russian Revolution, war, semi-feudalism, poverty, national underdevelopment, but also fueled by the national oppression that the Ukrainian people suffered under the Tsarist Empire. And so it's very important to see um, this distinctness of Ukraine and the dynamics of the struggle, even today, for social progress in Ukraine. Uh, it's, it, part of this struggle is a struggle for national identity, national affirmation, social justice, language and cultural rights. These things are incomplete today in Ukraine, and it's part of the very complex mix that makes up the country. Uh, the other reason for looking at this uh, country as hallowed ground is because of the events of World War II, which uh, uh, Chris spoke, spoke briefly of. Uh, this is where many of the major battles of World War II were fought, and terrific sacrifices were made by the Ukrainian people in the struggle against fascism. That is, the invading fascist armies of Germany, Romania, Germany principally, of course, but other um, European countries were involved as well. And so uh, this is where by far the most number of people died during the, the Second World War. So that's also a very important part of 
uh, honoring the country, but also the, the people today who are the, um, the ancestors, recent ancestors. Some of them, many of them still alive uh, of, this, of this period of time. So we've had a war underway in eastern Ukraine since April of this year. Uh, it's called by the Ukrainian government an anti-terrorist operation. So this is, a, this is a war within Ukraine by the Ukrainian government against the people in the east of the country who are demanding political autonomy. So right away when you see a government identify not just some people as we're used to in Canada and the United States, but actually a, a section of their country is terrorist, you know there's a problem going on because wars against terrorists are never uh, pleasant things. Uh, that are waged by the imperialists. And this has been a, a nasty, a brutal, bloody war. There's been thousands of uh, civilians as well as self-defense fighters in eastern Ukraine have, who have died. Um, there has been tremendous property destruction because the Ukrainian government has been shelling and bombing its cities. It's not been able to take the largest cities in the re most rebellious region of Ukraine in the southeast. So instead it's been bombing, rocketing. It's unbelievable that this could go on in Europe today, but there you have it, a government uh, perpetrating this. And so the, uh, you know, the humanitarian consequences have been very extreme. Uh, these have been war crimes carried out today in modern Europe by a government with the backing of the European Union, NATO, Canada, the United States. And in addition to the thousands that have been killed and injured, um, many more than a million have been made refugees. It's estimated that there's a million refugees in Russia from eastern Ukraine, that is, and then several hundreds of thousands more who've gone westward to other parts of Ukraine, where incidentally much less um, resources and services are available to them. When people go to Russia, they're relatively taken care of. They can get jobs. Many of them moved into uh, the further regions of Russia where jobs in the natural resource industries, for example, are are available and so forth. Not so, they're doing not so well in Ukraine because it's a country that's already quite a bit poorer uh, than Russia, but also in which those that are waging the war, which is the Ukraine government and its European allies, have lots of money for war and weapons, but not so much money for looking after the refugees who are the consequence of the war. And so uh, it's a very difficult situation in Ukraine today for these hundreds of thousands and also for the people who are, you know, let's call it an inconvenience, but use that in a you know, proper, respectful way. All of a sudden, your small town or village has got to look after hundreds of, maybe thousands of refugees from a war. It's not easy for you. They're doing it in Ukraine, certainly. That's how the refugees are surviving in the absence of government support. But nonetheless, it, this is ha having an impact um, throughout the whole country. Uh, and not to speak of the fact that, you know, in waging the war, one of the decisions that the Ukraine government had to make was to reinstitute uh, compulsory military service. And so there's been tremendous protests from uh, uh, people in Ukraine about having their sons or fathers dragged off to a war in eastern Ukraine. Um, you may have heard of a ceasefire which was signed in Minsk on September 5th. It was the result of a pushback by the uh, pro-autonomy self-defense forces in southeast uh, uh, Ukraine uh, with uh, volunteers and other forms of military assistance coming from Russia which dealt a devastating blow to the Ukrainian army. The, the real story was never really told, but there, were, there was a counter-offensive at the end of uh, August which uh, had very uh, deadly consequences. Thousands of Ukrainian soldiers were killed in the counter-offensive. A very tragic event, really, that these soldiers had been thrown into this war front. Many of them conscript, uh, conscripted, not volunteers at all. So that's been September 5th, but the Ukrainian government is rapidly rearming with the assistance of NATO. So. And, and the ceasefire uh, itself on September 5th was a very unsatisfactory ceasefire. It basically drew a line down the middle of the most rebellious regions of southeast Ukraine, which is the, the provinces or regions, call them, of Donetsk and Luhansk. And so now there's a ceasefire line with weapons on each side. Not a very stable or uh, confident ceasefire. Tomorrow there's to be a national election in Ukraine for the national parliament. And then after that I think all bets are off. A lot of us hope that maybe the winter would preclude seeing a renewal of the military offensive by the Ukraine army, but unfortunately that may not be the case because they are getting re-equipped. Um, and they're, they're rapidly solving their biggest domestic problem right now, which is to provide heating for the people of Ukraine. Because the dispute which has been provoked with Russia over gas supply uh, has a big question mark over whether uh, Ukraine firstly will 
wants to acquire gas from Russia, who will pay for it? Because Ukraine, the government is bankrupt, so who, European Union is going to have to subsidize this, and all kinds of other complications that go into this. So if they solve, first of all, I get the election out of the way, and we'll see what that produces tomorrow, how, how well the far-right parties do in Ukraine in that election. But then secondly, the provision of fuel, food, all the basics to get the country through six months of winter, then we'll see if, if the war will resume. We hope not, but um, we're not confident. We don't see any signs coming from Kiev that uh, this will be the case. Now, since the ceasefire, we've discovered two very disturbing things. Number one, the presence of mass graves in the areas of the southeast that were controlled back and forth by the, uh, the Ukraine government. And so these are inspectors of the OSCE who, who are in, have been in Ukraine. They have a permanent mission there, the OSCE. So they've gone out and done the inspections. This has been reported, but you won't have read of this in the Globe and Mail or the Vancouver Sun. What's the OSCE? Sorry, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is um, supposed to provide for the security of Europe. And they have an ongoing monitoring mission in Ukraine that's looking at all aspects of the war. They've actually produced some very informative reports over these months. Um, but the other thing is what we discovered just at the beginning of this week, which is that the Ukraine government was using cluster bombs against its civilians. Shocking to learn of this. Um, but, you know, again, this goes back to April, and probably we began to see the use of cluster musicians in June, July, as, as the war was really heating up. Now, again, you won't hear about this. Believe it or not, this news is not on the CBC website. There's not been a peep, not a peep, from a member of parliament in Ottawa about this discovery. And incidentally, this is coming from the New York Times and from the Human Rights Watch. So no question of any bias at play here. Um, and to the extent that there has been some information on this in Canada's print media, it, what it's done is it's taken wire service stories and, which feature the denials of the Ukrainian government that it's using um, that it's using cluster weapons. So we can all decide if we're going to trust the New York Times and Human Rights Watch or a government that's been waging war against its own population using bombs, shells, rockets. So, you know, who are you going to believe in that consequence? I think the answer is pretty clear. So this also is something just, you know, since the ceasefire, which has really just underlined how serious um, and terrible this war has been for for the Ukrainian people. Now, the background to the war is the political change that took place in Kiev, in Ukraine, in late February of this year. A long-standing dispute over what the political course and economic course of the country should be was being played out in very harsh conditions. Should uh, Ukraine continue with its close economic association with Russia, or should it make an abrupt turn from that and a turn towards Europe? But this is not the Europe of the 1960s and 70s, of social welfare, of investments in, in productive uh, manufacturing. This is the Europe of austerity. This is the Europe of Greece, of Spain, of, of, of all of Ireland, all the countries that have uh, been through terrible regimes of austerity with all the consequences. That's the Europe that the new Ukraine government that came into power in February wants to do. And this, this was arguably a coup, a, a, a political coup d'etat that took place at the end of February. The existing government, which was prepared to leave relations with Russia and Europe as they were and do more, um, um, do more, I could say, consultation. This was not a really democratic government, but it was embarked on a course of consultation, including early elections for the presidency. It was chased from power by the movement known as Maidan, which was a protest movement against a, a corrupt, capitalist, unequal government, which, but which over uh, the course of 2013 and then really sharply in early uh, 2014 was essentially, um, uh, the, the political leadership of this movement was taken firmly by the extreme right. One of the reasons that they were able to do this is that the, the Maidan movement, which is also called the Euro Maidan movement, uh, you know, was a movement of lots of ordinary Ukrainian people who want to make this shift to Europe. And the shift to Europe, you know, means, well, think, you know about the IMF programs. When you turn to the IMF for loans, what do you get? Well, we'll give you the loans, but you have to cut your government spending, cut your social services, uh, cut your 
any measures that you might have to protect your national industry, your agriculture, or whatever. Um, and of course, all this would, to do this it would have serious consequences for the relations with Russia, because Russia is not going to allow Ukraine to become a funnel for the kind of favorable trading relations that Ukraine had with Russia. So Russia's got to rethink its, whether it's going to continue to buy manufactured items from Ukraine, coal, uh, whether it's going to continue to buy agricultural products, because Ukraine is a very important agricultural country. So you see this turn in February had profound consequences for the whole country. And the reason why the rebellion rose in the East was the people in the East had the most to lose by this, because their industries, which compared to modern European industries, are relatively less efficient, less competitive, and so on, but have more or less an assured market in Russia. They're going to be up for grabs. So is steel making in Ukraine going to be able to stand up well to the steel making in France, for example? And those of you familiar with the, uh, the notions of free, free trade know that there's nothing free about free trade at all. There's free trade when it's to the advantage of the powerful, but when they need to subsidize, provide tax breaks, all the other advantages to national industries in order to compete internationally, well, all of a sudden it's not free anymore. So this is what Ukraine is up against, the European BMR. And the people in the East said, no, we're not going to go down that path. This means we lose our industry, we lose our uh, economic relations with Russia, and there are terrifically unknown consequences of what all this means. Well, we still have a free border, more or less free, to go back and forth to Russia. I'm Russian speaking, that, that is the people of Eastern Ukraine. We're Russian speaking in a majority. So what does this turn uh, mean? What does it mean for the assurance that our language will still be in the school system in public broadcast? All these things are up for grabs. And the answer of the Kiev government to all this was, shut up. We've decided on the course and we're going to do it. And, we're, and in fact, we're going to appoint your governors. We're not going to accept your demand that your governors and your 26 regions I showed you earlier will be elected. And, oh, and by the way, these right-wing violent gangs that are allied with the government are going to come into your region and make sure that you don't carry out social protests like the Maynan movement was doing. So it was a sharp rupture that was proposed, and this was the origin of the war because the people in eastern Ukraine began to do like Maidan. In March and April, they began to occupy government buildings, stage protests in the streets. Um, and they got repression like the people of Maidan got, but they got a whole lot worse. They got a war. And they got fascist militias being organized in the west of the country who be then began to descend on eastern Ukraine as they're, they're, they're like an auxiliary of the Ukraine army. Which, by the way, was an army in very bad shape. That's why they had to bring conscription back in. And that's also why they had to support the formation of right-wing militias. Because the ordinary conscript soldiers are being told, oh, go to eastern Ukraine, here's your orders, shoot that village, artillery in that village, and the, there was many instances in, in March, April, and May of the ordinary Ukrainian soldiers saying, no way, we refuse the order. But that response was less li much less likely from the right-wing militias. So, five reasons why we should be concerned about the situation in Ukraine. As anti-war activists, as socially progressive people uh, here and around the world, one is that it's a government of war and austerity in power in, in Kiev. One of the few governments of war that we've actually had in Europe. Yes, I know European governments, they go abroad and wage war. But until now, they don't wage war in their own populations. Well, that's Ukraine is, and as Yugoslavia was before, is a signal that something bad is shifting in Europe, where this could be, not only that this could happen, it could actually be tolerated and accepted and, and egged on by the major powers of Europe and North America. We've seen the rise of right-wing um, nationalism and fascism in Ukraine. For the first time since World War II, we have representatives of extreme right uh, parties in the government of Ukraine. I don't mean in the parliament, because lots of European countries have right-wingers and fascists in, in, in their parliaments. But in Ukraine, they've been appointed to the government as ministers, including ministers of defense, ministers of policing, and so forth. Um, we're seeing unprecedented attacks on democratic rights in Ukraine, and I don't have time to list them all here. That's an that's important subject of its own right, but the banning of political parties, newspapers, um, just a host of things, purging of the public service. Uh, and mostly, if you want to have a protest in Western Ukraine today against the war, or maybe you've got a, you're against conscription, Conscription, okay, they're not going to attack the relatives of the soldiers, but if you have a demonstration against war, forget it. 
because you're going to have the, the right wing gangs are going to come and beat the hell out of you and your demonstration will last as long as they're permitted, uh, as they allow it to happen because the police will stand by and watch and this has happened time and time again. So the, the right to protest in the streets is extremely restricted now in Ukraine, especially if you're protesting against the war. Um, you know, I mentioned the change in February that created this war, but it's been the egging on by NATO because it, what's happened, the events in Ukraine are just the continuation of NATO policy since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that, that policy, notwithstanding the promises that were made to the former Soviet Union, now Russia, that NATO would not seek to take advantage of the chaos following the collapse of the Soviet Union and expand eastward, it's done exactly what it said it wouldn't do. And so a host of countries have become um, uh, members of NATO since, uh, since 1989, which is a very direct uh, military threat to, um, uh, to Russia, but also to countries like Ukraine that so far are not part of NATO and have opted out of that. And lastly, the, uh, the concern is, and I mentioned, I've touched on this earlier, is that you know, this war that's being waged is in part a war against national rights, against all the different national minorities that exist in Ukraine. And I'll show you some figures here. Well, there you have a list of the gray, leave Germany aside. Or actually, no, include Germany, because that's East Germany. So there is all the countries that NATO said that we won't accept as members. We won't, that'd be provocative. We understand. We all agree. This, this is 20, uh, 20 plus years ago, all changed. And so these figures are, they're outmoded, because if you, know, if you see my note, the actual language of the majority of Ukraine is Russian. There's complicated reasons for that. Or there's a language called uh, Shurzhik, which is a mix of Ukrainian and Russian. So that's really the, the language is spoken in the street. But if you sort of try and probe into people's national backgrounds, uh, you might get something like this. I think the figures for Ukrainian versus Russian are probably uh, imbalanced. But uh, most importantly, I wanted to point to the other uh, national minorities who, who live in Ukraine and have as much concern as the Russian minority in Ukraine, or Russian majority, depending on how you you know, analyze it, of what their future is in this country. They don't want to be part of this hyper-centralized Ukraine in which their language, uh, rights, their cultural rights, their economic development can be subject to the whims of whatever government gets elected next time around. And Ukraine is a highly centralized uh, governmental system. Nothing resembling what we have here with provinces in, in states. For example, Quebec, which exercises considerable political autonomy concerning its language and cultural rights. Nothing like that except where it's imposed de facto. Like in Eastern Ukraine, you know, Russian is the language and that there's just, so far, the, um, apart from a, a short initiative that was taken uh, shortly after the change of government, um, the, Rush, the Ukraine government is not suggesting that, you know, there be a kind of forced Ukrainization of Eastern Ukraine, but people are worried about that because that's what the right wing wants and they're very dominant in the Ukrainian government. And, you know, this shows you how high the, the Russian language percentages is in, uh, in, in parts of um, Ukraine. And especially I mentioned Luhansk and Donetsk here, the 70% and 80% area. That's, that's been the heart of the rebellion. And it's where the ceasefire line is basically drawn down the middle of those regions. Um, so these are you know, quite large um, percentages of people whose first language is Russian and certainly whose language of life and of work is Russian. And they don't want some right-wing government in Kiev coming along and saying, well, no more television, no more radio, kids are going to go to school in Ukraine, and so forth and so forth. So this has been a part of the, the issue. But of course the other part of this is that the Ukrainian people themselves have suffered from the NATO offensive. The right wing of Ukraine doesn't speak for the Ukrainian nation. They speak for right wing nationalism and fascism. But the Ukrainian nation historically has fought for, for language, culture, social progress. And that's still the case today. That's, uh, that's what NATO is attacking, at least it, it's a consequence of the NATO attack. If they don't sit down and figure this out, I doubt that. But it's certainly a consequence is that the capacity of, of Ukraine to be a nation and to move forward is very uh, much compromised by all these developments. And the proof of this is, is the last 25 years themselves. Ukraine has not made much advance as a nation. It's run today by wealthy oligarchs. It's, it's language and culture that you, this Ukraine government has a language and culture policy, but it takes no account of the language and culture of the ordinary people of Ukraine. And I don't mean just the Russian speaking people, I mean the people that speak Surzhik or the people who speak Ukrainian, but they don't speak Ukrainian the way 
they don't speak the equivalent of the Queen's English. They speak the Ukrainian of the streets, and they want to, you know, have this uh, respected and looked after. I'm going to skip through um, some of the slides because uh, it'll take me longer than the 30 minutes I want to take. You all know about Crimea, the secession in mid-March. This is really what touched off the war because NATO and Kiev, but NATO in particular, had real ambitions for Crimea because this is where Russia's, in Sevastopol, this is where Russia's Black Sea Fleet was. They would love nothing better than have that taken over by a right-wing uh, government in Kiev and then kicked and the the treaty that had that allows you know Russia to have its military base there now contrary to all the propaganda you heard Crimea is not part of Ukraine it was made part of Ukraine by an administrative decision of the Soviet Union in 1954 which made sense at the time probably although some people might say you know historically it was just a bad decision all around but Let's give the benefit of the doubt and say it was a good decision in 1954 because they were rebuilding after World War II. As you can see, the land connection to Ukraine and the water supply into Crimea, which is a very arid region, were coming from Ukraine. So it made sense. But when, they, when the people in Crimea looked at what was happening in Kiev and then they saw this coming to power over the right-wing government, they said, whoa, get us out of here. We don't want to be part of this. And they st uh, a, 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 a referendum was quickly held in March. And arguably not the most perfect conditions for a democratic referendum, but no question the majority of people in Crimea just wanted out. They voted to, uh, uh, to join, or you could say rejoin, uh, Russia. But that was like the last straw for NATO. Because NATO said, oh, look, Russia, who we were trying to get to be a reliable capitalist partner, won't play the, our game. They won't tell the Crimean people, like Kiev is telling them, to shut up and put up with the pro-Europe austerity right-wing agenda. They've done something opposite, so oh, they're not our friend anymore. And this is really the source of the friction and conflict with Russia ever since, is that Russia won't be the policeman, firstly of Crimea and then of eastern Ukraine. So they've not been forgiven for that. That's the demand. You act, you, we want you to act the way that Egypt is acting against the Palestinians in Gaza, for example. That's what they want Russia to be, and that's, that's why all the hostility uh, has grown ever since, the threats and, of course, the sanctions against uh, Russia. And then, you know, we're familiar with all the propaganda that arose. You know, it was interesting to see in, the f in, in February and then in early March, you actually got sort of re objective reporting from Crimea. I remember there were Globe and Mail reporters there. CBC was there. They were kind of telling you what was really going on. But once that referendum was closed, boom, the door closed. No more objective coverage. Now it's just, you know, the madman in Moscow who wants to take over the world. I mean, this, this one is unbelievable because this is the Globe and Mail in late July. The, the image there you recognize, but they actually don't have the name Vladimir Putin on the front page there. So the message is, there is the image, like, are you so dumb that you don't get our message here? That, you remember that famous phrase in the US election, it's the economy, stupid or something? I mean, that's what they're kind of, this is what this is, like, don't be so dumb that you haven't quite got that the biggest threat to the world today is Vladimir Putin. It's incredible, the messaging that uh, has come out on this. It's like a death mask. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is just all all over the, the media. And then, of course, we had the crash of the Malaysian Airlines. Now, I urge you to, if you go to this, you may not be able to write down this link here, but if you go to my website, rogeranis.com, oh yeah, it's not even visible. <laughs> um, no, it's down all the way. I have to just block up the um, thing here to raise it a little bit. But if you, um, if you go to this, um, news posting that I've just made, there's an interesting Russian documentary film on the crash of the Malaysian Airlines that's been produced and what I did was I have some introductory notes to the video and importantly that the Russian Union of Engineers conducted a comprehensive study in August that was translated into English in September and I wouldn't have said this back in August, July or August, but I would say it today. There's very compelling evidence that this Malaysian Airlines plane was shot down by the Ukraine Air Force either by a rogue set of officers wanting to provoke an incident, which, you know, let's think about it. Has this crash worked to the advantage of the government in Kiev? I think so. Um, but importantly also, the investigation itself, there has been no serious investigation. It's been bits and pieces. And as the Russian 
film documentary uh, shows you, the, this plane, or not this one, this is just an image, but the plane that came down, it's still lying in pieces in the field in eastern Ukraine. How do you piece together what happened? Because the first thing you do when a plane crashes is you put all the pieces together. You've seen the stories of other plane crashes, big warehouse. You basically rebuild the plane. Of course, this is the dominant narrative. Russia is more or less what it was, well, it's, it's not like it was under the Tsarist uh, empire. I mean, some people called the Soviet Union imperialist, so you could use that analogy. I didn't. But, you know, they're basically likening Russia to kind of a 19th century imperialist country, like the United States, that just goes out and grabs whatever territory it wants. And the proof, ah, Crimea, isn't that the proof? And aren't we being told that that's the, um, that's the objective in, in, uh, in Ukraine? Well, I mean, factually, no. Factually, if you look at Russia's re uh, relationship to the situation in Crimea, and above all in eastern Ukraine, you don't see a country trying to grab territory. You don't even see a country with you know, really significant investments making lots of money. You, uh, Crimea today is a huge financial burden on Russia to absorb Crimea because the living standards in Ukraine were half what they were in Russia. So Russia today has got to bring up all of the social spending that it does for pensions, healthcare, education. That's all got to be doubled in Crimea. And they've got, a, you know, they've got sanctions which have hit Crimea when I was there in July, I couldn't use my credit card. We saw how the, the tourist hotels were down sharply. So the Russian government also has to bring in some, some serious economic investment into the region. So it's not, and that, the, you know, this would be 10 times worse for the Russian government in Eastern Ukraine. It inherits Eastern Ukraine, what? Outmoded industry? Sure, they have important ties and, and Russia doesn't want to lose that production that it buys from Eastern Ukraine, but boy, it sure doesn't want to absorb, you know, quite, I won't say antiquated, but you know, less competitive industry compared to Europe. That's, that'll be another huge drain. So you just don't see it. And I think that there's six really compelling arguments for why we, uh, we just, this argument of Russia being imperialist just don't, um, uh, aren't accurate. And I think those are all, you know, very scientific economic measurements that you can take. And myself and a few others have begun to do this. We're going to do a lot more because this is really gets to the heart of what, um, uh, the confusion over uh, Russia's role really is. And I want to stress the last point there, number six. How is it that a country like Denmark or even Holland, Iceland, how can they, how can they be in the Middle East bombing, well I won't say Iceland, Denmark is, how can these small European countries have seemingly such considerable economic and, and military powers? Because they work in alliances the imperialist countries learned through two catastrophic world wars that they can't run the world like that anymore. They can't go to war with each other over who's going to control Asia, who's going to... No, they have to have mechanisms to mediate this. And they've created all these after World War II. They've created their military alliances, but they've also created these huge uh, economic institutions. And I would argue they created the United Nations for this purpose as well. They can't, you know, they just can't do it again because they almost lost their world, their system, uh, during the first two world, world wars. And so they have this this mechanism of mediation where they, their, their interests are very sharply united uh, and not just in Europe where they have NATO, well let's say in Europe and North America. I mean, this is a world system they've created and yes they have conflicts and they compete with each other economically but they don't go to war with each other. So where's the equivalent of Russia's alliance that has it dominating the world through an alliance with, with who? You know, name me a significant country that Russia is in a military alliance with. You know, don't talk to me about Armenia or Belarus um, no, it, it, you know, this, this alone, I think, should wake us up to, uh, to see and understand what, uh, what Russia is today, that we don't see this, um, uh, this uh, military power expressed uh, through, um, uh, through alliances, whereas, you know, even the smallest countries of Europe can be pretty powerful forces thanks to, thanks to membership in NATO. So I'm going to stop there because I want to uh, I want to hear your questions and your comments, your criticisms. Because maybe you know what I've said here, uh, you take exception to, and that's fine. And I'll just as we talk, I'll run through a few suggested readings that I have uh, listed here. Uh, we do have a new website where it's been slow in getting it launched. It's called new new cold war dot net. It'll if you go online right now, you'll just get a message saying coming soon, and it is coming soon but it may be a week or so. But you can go to my website where I put not just what I've written, but a, quite a, a large volume of writings of other authors and also films, like the one I mentioned to you on the uh, Malaysian Airlines crash. So there's a lot of information there, but above all, you know, in a week or so, 
you'll be able to go to uh, newcoldwar.net and really, um, you know, we're really going to start building that website up uh, for vital information so we can kind of do, you know, do what some of the things that I'm suggesting that we uh, need to do here. So thanks for your attention. I look forward to your questions and comments.